Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've just been told by the system in a very sort of assertive voice that this meeting is being recorded. Um, and a good thing too, because I'm sure it's going to be an excellent uh, 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 seminar. Um, we're very fortunate to have Sylvia Chittell from uh, University College London, who's come to speak to us about eternity causes in a democratic, in democratic constitutionalism, a book which has just come out. And we've got three uh, 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 enthusiastic responders straining at the uh, uh, straining at their leashes: um, Haley Hooper, Ewan Smith, and Renata Uitz. Um, Sylvia, you're going to speak for about ten minutes or so to introduce the topic, and then I'll hand over to the respondents. I should say we will have an opportunity for questions and answers, but um, if you type your questions into the chat function, I will or the Q and A function. I will uh, read them out to the panel rather than hand over to you. So if you have questions, and I hope you do, please do uh, chat, type them into the uh, question and answer function and I will put them to the panel after we've heard from the speakers. So uh, Sylvia, I, I hand the floor over to you to tell us about your great book. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you to everyone at the Bonaparte Institute for having me. It is a great pleasure and an honor to uh, have the Institute host this book launch. And I would like to especially thank, of course, the chair and the panelists for taking the time to, to read the book and engage with its ideas at a very busy time. Uh, the events team uh, at the Bonaparte Institute for so expertly uh, putting it all together. Um, and last but not least, of course, the wonderful Leia Trublot without whom uh, none of this would have happened. And um, thank you also to everyone in the audience for joining us uh, this afternoon. And I should say, if you're keeping your eye on uh, the Turkey Wales game, I will not judge. Now, I was tasked with offering a very brief background uh, to this research and an introduction to the book. And I'll do that as quickly as I can to leave more time for comments and discussion. So the book started many moons ago as my doctoral research in Edinburgh. And back then, I think there hadn't yet been the realization that eternity clauses, in other words, unamendable provisions in co constitutions or judicially crafted doctrines of unamendability, uh, often known as basic structure doctrines or minimum core doctrines, were either as widespread as they are or that they were continuing to spread and be adopted with newer jurisdictions opting for either a formal or an informal type of constitutional unamendability. The eternity clause in the German basic law um, and India's basic structure doctrine were then perhaps the most well-known examples of each of these and might continue to be so. Um, and because of the particular circumstances in which these had been adopted and developed, certain assumptions pervaded our understanding and analyses of unamendability, a link to militant democracy, um, as in Germany's case, with a formal eternity clause um, at the farthest end of a constitutional rigidity spectrum, a similar link to resisting constitutional disintegration during times of emergency, as in India's case in the aftermath of its um, famous Kesavananda Bharati case uh, and its development of the basic structure doctrine. So the prevailing understanding seemed to be, and again, to an extent still is, that unamendability was a measure of last resort um, against what we would today call democratic backsliding or abuse of constitutionalism, i.e. the subversion of the constitution through otherwise procedurally sound amendments. And of course, uh, comparative experience was always richer than, uh, than that. And the scholarship has since grown exponentially and um, caught up with this complexity. Many of you will be familiar with the work of scholars like Richard Albert, Yannick Grosnay, Rosalind Dixon, David Landau, including the work of some of our uh, wonderful panelists tonight, uh, which has helped advance our understanding of comparative constitutional amendment quite significantly. But to my mind, there still remained a gap because while we all accepted a tension, the tension between constitutionalism and democracy created by taking certain substantive <clears throat> amendments off the table, the tension um, tended to be understood in the same key as the age-old um, tension surrounding constitutional review. In other words, and while perhaps particularly egregious, views on constitutional courts um, striking down amendments on substantive grounds often tracked people's positions surrounding the legitimacy of judicial review more generally. So while exceptional in its effects, unamendability was thought to be justified, again, as a measure of 
last resort against um, the worst of constitutional violations. And in this story, constitutional change tended to be viewed in the negative, with amendments potential Trojan horses for constitutional subterfuge, if not implosion, and with constitutional courts as the would-be saviors um, wisely intervening at the last minute to halt the destruction. So in the book, I argue that this story um, misses important aspects of um, eternity clauses or unamendability doctrines, which make them unique, both uniquely appealing and uh, sometimes uniquely dangerous. Uniquely appealing because it is precisely their um, special features that attracts, continues to attract constitutional makers and constitutional uh, courts. To give you a few examples, the bluntness of um, unamendable presidential term limits as an insurance policy against overstay in office, which makes these types of eternity clauses so widespread in many of the constitutions in Africa and Latin America, especially, or the wide ranging unamendable human rights commitments in uh, post-conflict constitutions, especially. I discuss in the book, for instance, Bosnia uh, Kosovo, but this is a feature present in many post-conflict constitutions meant to signal and enshrine these countries never again. Or uh, to give one last example here, the expectation that basic structure or minimum court doctrines, because of their particular structural nature, um, could allow courts to address whole packages of amendments that cumulatively undermine um, the constitutional democratic architecture. And this has recently become relevant again uh, in the case of Kenya, where the, the High Court uh, just last month delivered its much anticipated BBI judgment, um, embracing a basic structure doctrine to block President Kenyatta's attempt to expand um, executive power. And you know, it was a whole package of amendments that was seen as, as quite problematic from a democratic point of view. But I argue uh, in the book, eternity clauses are uniquely dangerous as well, and we should not look away from that potential danger. I call them, I call this the dark side of unamendability in the book itself. Um, and I give um, sort of various uh, examples from comparative um, practice to show, one, that eternity clauses do not always enshrine liberal democratic constitutional ideals, but may and often do insulate exclusionary and majoritarian values and principles. And they often do this at the heart of otherwise democratic constitutions that have been um, accepted within the family of democratic constitutions. So there is a tension that they create within the constitutional text um, themselves. I also show that they are not always relied on as a measure of, of last resort, but to stifle otherwise uh, reasonable democratic change in the name of a pre-commitment whose guardian constitutional court purports to be. And I also show that they are often very difficult, if not impossible, to rein in, uh, to push back, or indeed to amend out or reverse. I also discuss other uh, developments in the book uh, to show that unamendability continues to migrate and has um, shifted and morphed into new doctrines and new ways for courts to intervene including the embrace of forms of constitutional identity review, particularly in Europe, using unamendability as an anchor to um, stop European integration projects. Uh, and we can discuss whether that's a, a, you know, a worthy development or not, but it's certainly novel in, in the past uh, few years, or the potential rise of constitutional amendment review by supranational courts, with examples from the European uh, Court of Human Rights intervening in, uh, in the case of Hungary and possibly uh, in the future as well to sanction abusive amendments in its member states. So the book really is an attempt to, to recenter the democratic critique of eternity clauses and unamendability more generally and argues that we should take it seriously on its own terms and with the benefit of the plenitude of, of case studies at our disposal. I'll stop there and look forward to the comments. Thank you. Well, Sylvia, th thank you very much for that um, introduction to your book. Um, the first responder is Hayley, um, Hayley Hooper. So I pass over to Hayley. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I guess the form that these things usually take is you say a few nice things about the book and then you ask a few questions. And this is one of these occasions where the things that I have to say that are complimentary about the book are, are things that I truly believe. And I truly think this is a major contribution 
to the literature on comparative constitutional law generally, but specifically reading as a domestic public lawyer who occasionally dabbles in a bit of comparative work. It really was an eye opener because it unseated a lot of fundamental assumptions that I had about constitutions. You know, it seems to me just kind of prima facie quite reasonable. If you're going into any kind of new relationship, whether that be a business deal, a friendship, um, a constitution, that you kind of mark in the sand your non negotiables and that becomes your kind of working paradigm or assumption. And this book really grabs that um, type of assumption by the scruff of the neck and interrogates it really, really thoroughly and really, really well. Um, on top of that, and it's really that you do get to say this, it reads extremely well. So it's an extremely digestible introduction for, as I would class myself, as the reader, the ignorant scholar. And I think it makes a several major contributions. One is it's just its sheer breadth. Like, everything has been covered. Everything that can reasonably be grabbed in terms of assessing an eternity uh, within the eternity clause paradigm has been looked at, has been treated, has been sensibly engaged with and something reasonable has been said about it. It also doesn't simply look at eternity clauses textually, which I think is a massive contribution. It doesn't simply look at these provisions of a codified constitution and limit eternity clauses to that. The, the ability to bring the judicially created doctrines within this paradigm and interrogate them as almost kind of stealth eternity clauses in some ways, I think is a really major, major contribution and a major um, progress in the literature. So if you haven't picked up on already, I think you should buy and read the book. Um, and I think one really good example, um, or one really good thing the book does is, is, is takes our instinct that if we have a kind of never again moment, post-conflict moment, then we want to enshrine an eternity clause. But the empirical work that's been done in this book is it shows up that often, to, to quote the book, the constitutions in need of an eternity clause are most likely to fall prey to its limitations. So I thought that was a really interesting um, observation and perhaps and Sylvia's contribution builds on this by saying that the main objection to eternity clauses, whether explicit or judicially created, is that they tend to entrench a black box of abstract commitments. You might think that constitutions kind of do that more broadly, but I think there is enough work done in this book to show something specific happens when we take a specific form either of adjudicative language or of constitutional code language um, to meet the criteria for an eternity clause. Um, I think the discussions of the basic structure doctrine and the idea of one constitutional constitutional amendments um, are illuminating, um, particularly with respect to some of the more recent developments in Buddhist for fashion jurisprudence in the Vice case. Um, where you have a very, very interesting example of judicial, it's kind of hard to find the right word, I'm going to say overreach, um, of the German Constitutional Court, where they simply say that a kind of tried and trusted line of authority from the European Court of Justice on judicial review of the central bank is simply inadequate. I also thought it was very interesting that Israel was chosen as an example because it's one of the few uncodified constitutions in the United, uh, in, the, in, in the world, but doc, uh, Dr. Sirtu points out that eternity clauses in the form of the basic law, in particular the, the example enacted in 2019, actually have a serious exclusionary effect. So I wanted to kind of sit back in my laurels and think, well, you know, that's great, but this just isn't a great British problem, is it? Um, but this book genuinely did prompt me to think a little bit harder in that. And this is kind of generally where my questions are directed, because um, I thought maybe this could be a kind of a, a problem, a problem for overseas. And then I, I did think it led me to think about some of the work that I've done myself. And I, I recently wrote a defense of some kind of line of authority in the common law that I called exceptional circumstances review stemming from the authorities in Jackson and Attorney General and going on and so forth and um, as being a very kind of sensitive and um, proper um, critique of the common law towards the legitimacy of legislation whether it comes from Westminster or the devolved administrations underpinned by democratic credentials and in that I dismissed an argument by Lord Newberger and his extrajudicial lecture, Who Are the Masters Now?, where he said, well, this line of authority is either historically incoherent, which I dispute, but if we put that to one side, he said, um, 
it really doesn't matter when the rubber hits the road because the time you would get to the need for this type of judicial review, then all the chips that we understand instead of constitutional statehood would have fallen. And I, I initially brushed that argument to one side. I genuinely did. Um, but taking very seriously the examples from Hungary and Poland has genuinely caused me to, to really reevaluate my own provision, uh, position on this. So I've got a couple of questions then. Um, number one is, do you see your um, analysis of eternity clauses I suppose judicially created, kind of applying to the British settlement in the same way that I do. And if so, would you class the Miller litigations as being part of that? Or are they part of the kind of more separate constitutional review? Um, my other follow up question to that um, is related to something you said in your introduction. You, you I suppose you, you sort of said that there's a general general long line of scholarship objecting to or questioning the paradigm of strong form constitutional review. To what extent does your analysis sit kind of discrete and separately? Does it overlap? Is it part of a spectrum? And then finally, um, my final question is that kind of relates again to, to a problem that I saw um, eliminated in, in the British constitutional order when I was um, writing on war powers. and. There'd been a kind of attempt at a constitutional convention and that had fallen flat in terms of really controlling what was going on. And then my co-author and I, we considered le uh, legislation and we thought that would kind of fall uh, fall flat in terms of, of, of real control of power. And it made me think, it made, a, it made us actually kind of conclude that what really matters um, is not necessarily rules and norms in the constitution, it's, it's, it's the will and the impetus of the actors. So my final question is that, kind of looking forward, um, it reminds me of, there's been a, a recent piece by Goldonian Wilkinson, I think it was about 27, 2018, on the material constitution, where they draw a distinction between the formal constitution, i.e. the text that might be written down. I think it's actually a distinction by Kelson that they're trying to re-enliven and reinvigorate. And the material constitution, which is the, the kind of social order and social fabric behind the constitution that is in fact the genesis and the driver. Um, my final question is, is at the end of the day, is the material constitution what matters? Or is there still a functional role for codified eternal eternity clauses and judicially created clauses going forward? Um, once again, I thought it was completely fantastic, genuine contribution to the literature. And yeah, I'm so glad to have been a part of this and to, to, to be able to put the time aside and to read it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hayley. Uh, you, you and your next. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, Hayley. Um, I'm going to say something very similar. Um, this is a very fine book indeed. It's imaginative, it's scrupulous, it's well written, its ideas are wide ranging, its examples are truly global, and its argument is important. Um, the first thing I want to do is just simply congratulate Sylvia on writing this book, and I'd like to encourage all of you to read it, or at a very bare minimum, to buy it. <laughs> So the argument of the book, is, as Sylvia said, is I think the book um, emphatically demonstrates that eternity clauses aren't necessary components of successful democratic constitutions. And they might even in some cases be pernicious components of those constitutions. It supplies compelling examples, um, including constitutions like the Romanian constitution and the Israeli constitution, which catalyze majoritarian democracies, Sylvia argues and also constitutions such as those of, for example, Niger or Fiji, which entrench elite's privilege. Now, those are two things that I think eternity clauses are designed not to do. Now, because this is Oxford, I'm sure many of you think that this is the exact moment at which I pivot to trying to put the boot into the book. Um, I know some of you may even yearn for this. I can see it behind your eyes now, but that's not what I'm gonna do. Um, the points that I have to make in my time are really requests for Sylvia to say more about things that, as far as I can see, she couldn't explore fully in this book because of its scope. These aren't admissions in the book so much as just avenues for discussions. Please, please take them in that way. The three things I'm going to talk about are, first of all, I'd like to ask Sylvia to say more about the nature of the Constitution and how this affects the argument she's making. Second, if she can say more about the idea of self-government that, to my mind, underpins the argument that she's making. And third, say more about where this leaves judges. So I'll approach those questions not quite in that order, but beginning with this idea of the nature of the Constitution. So I'm going to start by reading a bit from page 128 of the book, for those of you, I assume the majority of you who have it in front of you. Um, 
And there's a section where Sylvia says, bear with me a moment. She distinguishes between the sorts of limits that she's interested in and what she calls political limits on amendments, such as those in the Constitution of the United Kingdom and the Netherlands. Insofar as these constitutions are politically enforced, and as the final word remains in legislatures, this form of informal or political unamendability is fundamentally different from judicial doctrines that have blocked constitutional amendment. Another category of eternity clauses includes what might be termed sociological limits on amendment, referring to those instances where a constitutional text may appear flexible, but societal understandings of particular values mean that they will not be changed in practice. This form of unamendability has been discussed in respect to the United States and Canada. And Sylvia, at the end of that paragraph, says that these types of unamendability are qualitatively different from judicially created unamendability. So my first question, Sylvia, is really, are they qualitatively different? Because it strikes me that there's some quite considerable overlap between political, sociological and doctrinal or juridical unenforceability provisions. I think many eternity questions combine all three and they include the kind of questions that we address the judges. So take something like interpretive conventions under the due process clause, Brown, Roe, Lochner. Um, take even constitutional rules outside the role of the judges like the filibuster rule. Um, I think in those cases, it's not easy and maybe not possible to isolate the rules of the formal constitution rules that I think you're principally interested in from a wider body of constitutional rules. And some of those rules, in my view, are actually much harder to amend than the written constitutional provisions with which you start chapter one. So to give you examples of those sort of political or sociological rules, just for, for those people joining this discussion, the rule that the United States constitution is justiciable. You know, that's not in the original text. It's Marbury that sets that down. The rule that, for example, the Chinese constitution isn't. The rule that um, the United States is an indestructible union of indestructible states. You know, an anti-secession rule comparable to section three of the Spanish constitution that you look at, or the rule that the Communist Party leads China. I think these ideas underpin our constitutions and they exist in dialogue with the kind of provisions that you're interested in in this book. They shine through the constitutional text that you place on top of them. And so I think I can understand why you, you've made the moves that you, are, you have. And that, as I say, I think it's a very fine book and it's the right move to make. But I think we know, you know that the formal constitution is a simplification. It first of all simplifies the rules we need to study to understand power. But it also simplifies the way that we legitimate those rules. So the arguments that you're interested in, arguments about pre-commitment, arguments about constituent power, draw on the idea that the constitution draws a line under what came before, that you can distinguish, as you say, qualitatively between those political rules and sociological rules and the rules you're interested in. But I don't think it does draw that line. And I think some aspects of what you know, Mark Tushnet would call the thin constitution draw on that continuity of rules. So I'm gonna read from another passage at page 96, where you talk about this, it's a really pithy way you talk about the distinction between the US and French constitution. Um, if we consider France's 15 constitutions since 1789, formally having distinct identities, but materially perhaps not, you compare the United States single constitution, which formally has one identity, but materially several. I thought that was really pithy and clever. And I think it points to this problem, that actually maybe it's easier than it looks for us to say what the French constitution is at its core, because it describes an historical, political, sociological process that leads back to 1789, not the formal content of the 1954 constitution. And if we draw on that, we can maybe start to build the sort of democratic argument that's orthogonal to the one that you critique in this book. So that, that's my first question. So can you say a bit more about those sorts of rules? So the second thing I wanna talk about is the way in which this move tilts our focus towards judges and towards the judicial exegesis of constitutions. The book's broader than that, as Haley's just mentioned, you know, addresses not just the sort of explicit provisions of written constitutions, also more interpretive phenomena, especially in part two. So I'm going to read another passage, which, which I, um, I thought was important in respect to judges, where, again, I think you, you, you simplify the problem in order to clarify the scope of the book, but there's more to see. And you're dealing with an argument that Mark Tushnet makes, where he says that a restrained version of an eternity doctrine provides a check on certain sorts of political process. And you say, you quote him saying, 
The mere existence of this doctrine may serve as a political check on the amendment process as a sword of Damocles that because it occasionally drops, cautions political actors against debating, devoting too many resources to attempting to alter the existing specification of some component of the basic structure. And the way that you get out of dealing with that directly in a book that's about judicial rules rather than political rules, as you say, these attempts can only be evaluated in practice. And you then lead into a very strong discussion about democratic backsliding, which challenges a, a fairly glib view of how backsliding works. You know, the, the idea that those wonderful Berlin cabarets did so much to stop the rise of Hitler and prevent the outbreak of the Second World War. Um, so I thought your argument on backsliding is good, but I wonder whether there's more to say about the political catalysis um, that these sorts of provisions provide in democratic constitutions. So first of all, I wonder if there's more to say about backsliding. You're right to focus on states like Hungary, but I wonder if this is the sort of sample that we need to look at to say that, in fact, these sorts of provisions don't prevent backsliding. You know, there are lots of examples where they don't, but maybe there are lots of examples where they do. So examples where the basic constitutional framework of a state retards an attempt to erode independent oversight in the United States over the last four years is quite an obvious one, but we can, we can go further with this. But similarly, I think this question of kind of whether this acts as a sort of Damocles, not just for judges, but for Congress, for the executive, the press, for, for other constitutional powerful actors, I think it's important. So you describe the judges as the guardians repeatedly through the book. I wonder why it's the judges. Why not other independent representatives of the state? You know, independent heads of federal commissions, civil servants in the United Kingdom and so on. Why not rules like the fact the Crown has to act on its, the advice of its ministers? Um, maybe a wider political and sociological approach to constitutional rules would lead us to be more forgiving of the way that these clauses affect those relationships. You know, do they structure a different sort of argument among political actors? But then ask, you know, are you, again, a refrain in the book is that you claim these judges are self-empowered. You know, you start that, I think that's both in the introduction and conclusion to the book. I wonder whether they're self-empowering or whether they're empowered. You know, whether the point of these clauses is to allow judges to engage in a discussion of what these clauses mean, and that that discussion is not just directed at litigants, it's directed much more widely than that. And if you are a judge who's trying to interpret that constitutional provision, you know, quite simply, I mean, this is, this is by no means a venturous constitutional theory here, can you correct incoherence? You know, do you simply have to rely on the raw historical data of how the constitution was battened together, or can you make more of that? Can you update atavistic constitutional provisions? And if judges can do that, can civil servants do that too? Can legislators? So that's my second point, really. It's, it's about the, the way in which the focus of the book tilts our focus towards judges. The final question I had is whether you can say more about the vision of self-government that lies at the heart of the book. And again, that starts at page seven, um, where you say, this book's approach is closer to what you call a, 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 a it's closer to a, 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 an understanding of democratic constitutionalism that takes seriously the constitution's promise of constitutional self-government. That view correlates with a particular understanding of constitutions and constitutional amendments informing this project. Now, I don't want to be in the spot here because I, I can see how that idea informs all of the things you say, but it's not an idea that you, you return to theoretically. It's an idea that you, you deal with throughout the argument of the book. So I, I thought that was, that was done subtly, but there's maybe more to say here. So what's the alternative? You know, what is this you know, vision of self-government? You know, is it consistent with say John Griffith's vision of the open society and self-government or, or Karl Popper's idea? Um, and practically what sorts of alternatives are there to constitutions that have a thin core that influences politics? Is that alternative Britain or is it a state like China or like North Korea? Um, Britain, as we know, sort of as Haley's already explored, does have eternity clauses. So the Union with Ireland Act 1800 says the Union with Ireland will be forever and it wasn't. <laughs> and it says the established Church of Ireland will be forever and it wasn't. So I think there's a real way that rules that you're considering more recent comments were. In a state that, that finally I want to deal with on this in terms of self-government is this idea of the sort of thin constitution, which I said I'd return to. You're right to argue that it's difficult to distinguish questions of constitutional identity from constitutional questions more broadly. You know, the, the, the boundaries of the thin constitution are at best porous. Any conception of constitutional identity is contestable, and there's a huge overlap between these two sorts of questions. 
So you call this at page 117 a concept that creates more problems than it solves. I think you're right. But that doesn't mean it doesn't solve some problems. <laughs> and it doesn't mean we can't solve the problems that it creates in other ways. So I don't think it's impossible to distinguish questions of the thin constitution or constitutional identity from other constitutional questions. And I certainly think it's possible to debate those questions as a civic community, as civil servants, as judges. And I think the example we, we talked about earlier in terms of France is a good example of a state whose irreducible constitutional core is formed historically and politically, and where the conversation about what that means is of the essence of, for example, the decision of the Conseil Constitutionnel in 1971 that you mentioned, where France's 1789 rights framework is blended into the, the framework of the 1954 constitution. Does the fact that that's indeterminate, as you describe it, mean the whole thing's indeterminate, or does it just mean that certain questions aren't going to produce determinate answers? Does that matter? So that's the final question I want to ask. Of how does this, what, can you tell us more about what you think about self-government and about the realistic alternative that we can provide to the sorts of constitutional processes that we see in other democratic states? But let me just come back to my first point, which is the most important one. It's a very, very fine book, and I'd like to congratulate you for writing it, and thank you for letting me read it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ewan. So we've had uh, two rave reviews so far, and now we turn to Renata to see if it be the uh, 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 the triple. Uh, Renata. Thank you very much, Nick. I, I really will not depart too much from, from the pattern. I have to say that I was delighted to see the book. We've known Sylvia with each other for less than a century, but more than a decade. And it was, it was absolutely lovely to, to see after so many years how her, her work comes together in, 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 in book form. I, it's, a, it's a wonderfully complex and very thought-provoking book and it does move the, the literature forward, no, no question about that. And indeed, it's written in a, in a very welcoming language, which is unusual for uh, on a subject which is so fraught with procedural technicalities. Uh, what I like very much about the book is how, without being too pompous about it, it recenters the constitutional canon because it actually does use the majority of the examples from the periphery in order to, to unpack some of the misunderstandings about the center, including long-standing assumptions uh, about the, the nature of, of constitutional amendment processes and, and limits on them. I, I have to say that the book is very clear from the, <clears throat> the outset, so there is no sort of puppet show that she's interested in the dark side of un unamendability about the abuse of, of powers that, that they permit, and also <clears throat> that it, it tests virtues that are routinely associated with unamendability, very often with absolutely no, uh, no empirical evidence. I, I love Sylvia working with, with fragile democracies and, and also with democratic backsliding because this is actually where much of the action happens at, at the moment. So having said this, it must be clear that I find the premises of, of her inquiry intuitively appealing, partly because I think we share the, that, that the suspicion based on trained intuition is the prime obligation of, of any constitutionalist. And this is a book driven by deep-seated suspicion, despite best intentions and, and, and a very keen eye on, on capturing uh, where we are being misled uh, or, or where a standard vocabulary is being abused. Uh, I, I have to admit that I don't find it comforting when, when Sylvia says that, uh, um, that eternity closes will not stop democratic backsliding because the enforcement mechanism is the first thing that the liberal and populist leaders compromise. But I think that this is an extremely crucial reminder how these experiences from the periphery actually speak to assumptions that we make on the basis of, of, of the center. Uh, and it's also, especially in the UK, a very well time reminder about the stakes of judicial reform and especially judicial reforms that, that seek to uh, affect or curb judicial review powers. Now, 
I, I, there are three points, and it's very similar to you, Anne, where, where I would actually like to, to hear more from, from Sylvia, partly uh, to, to stress test a little bit the, the overall architecture. Uh, when, she, when she presents the project in terms of constitutional pre-commitment versus democracy, it obviously leads to a very critical take on the judicial role and a, and a special interest in judicial self-perpetuation. Although let, let us emphasize that she, she enters, she acknowledges, and I think rightly, that there are moments where courts invite uh, themselves to find rules, constitutional amendments, unconstitutional, which safeguard judicial independence and also judicial review powers. So, so that's a very important discussion. Uh, what I what I did find, however, that this focus on on the critical focus on the judiciary is very often stopping at when is a court keen to defend the status quo, or when did it step in the way of change? And I, I believe that because of Sylvia's interest in, in practice, it would have been very important to, to look more closely on who brought the case, who did the court side with, because that's actually an, an indication of, of potential deference of, of, of activism. Uh, was the court which decided pact, threatened to be pact, and in, in general, was the amendment that you've seen part of a larger strategy to expose the court to court packing or unwanted reforms, which is which is more than once the case uh, when you put these particular judgments in a in a particular context. I, I think that an additional layer, which which would be interesting for the analysis, is looking at how these cases climbed judicial hierarchy. And the BBI judgment from Kenya will be the perfect example. Uh, former Justice William Mutunga predicted that after the groundbreaking high court judgment, the Court of Appeal will go more conservative and the Supreme Court is very unlikely to rule the same way. Uh, so it's not only the Indian judiciary that is routinely described as multivocal, but, but several, several other judiciaries are. And, and I think, and I will explain a little later why, I, I think that it would, have, it would be nice to hear a little more on this. Uh, now, a, a second point, and this is, this is the point about the militant democracy perspective, which is, which is extremely helpful in terms of analyzing pre-commitments. Uh, and also how highlights better than, than any other lands on, on how eternity closes and trench the status quo. So Sylvia is, is very much interested in how the activation of eternity closes actually perpetuates pre-existing or long-standing features of political architecture uh, that embed injustices and, and are tools of exclusionary politics, uh, I think actually this analysis would have been even stronger had those bits and pieces about who be, bring these cases and why uh, been, been more uh, directly exposed in, in the book. But where, where I, I'd like to hear a little more is how the, the militant democracy perspective uh, being a preventive concept is, is actually activated. So. Working a little more with militant democracy, always trying to prevent a disaster and ensuring that it never happens in, in the future. It would have been nice to see how the threat alerts are construed, both by political actors and by courts. You do it once when you talk about the Czech Constitutional Court's 2009 judgment. Uh, but but it definitely, and saying that, okay, there are historical experiences which courts are trying to avoid but especially in conflict settings, post-conflict setting and, and backsliding settings, this type of, of, of risk assessment is, is, is much more salient and, and sort of a, a live wire. Now, the, the third set of comments I have is about the transnational dimension. I think it's extremely important that you sort of bust the myth, bust the myth uh, that entrenching international human rights obligations is also a sure proof protection against tyranny through constitutional engineering. 
uh, the constitutionality, uh, uh, conventionality control jurisprudence is, is, is really analyzed in a, in a very sharp manner. Uh, where, where I was a little, again, and it goes back to what these courts do, I would have loved to listen to your, whether it makes any difference, whether a court actually affirms an unconstitutional amendment or put subsidiarity into action saying that, you know, I defer to national processes and, and I don't want to just, you know, touch it. I let it stay. I'm not going anywhere near. And so this takes me to, to a broader question, which is the question you was asking from a different direction of, of who is really the guardian of the constitution in the face of, of attempts at, uh, on un, unamendable un, provisions. The focus on the judiciary really doesn't allow much space in the last chapter about who else is there potentially. And while you are very reserved about procedural, about looking at uh, eternity closes as procedural hurdles on political deliberation, I think asking the looking for potential guardians would have situated this litigation, uh, these litigation efforts more broadly in, in deliberation about constitutional amendments. And of course, this is where it's a question, how early do courts cut off certain lines of argument or disagreement? And what does it mean if, uh, uh, and, and are there differences between every Kurd being a terrorist as opposed to we are not going to uh, we are not going to to talk about territorial challenge against challenges against territorial integrity, but that doesn't necessarily thwart administrative reforms. So I I, I really think that uh, looking at a little bit the judicial involvement as part of a deliberative process would have helped. In instances where judicial review of the amendment is not part of the formal constitutional amendment process, when it's actually unwelcome by those who are planning to, to amend the constitution. Uh, and, and so there are, because of, of, of how I'm inclined, I, I can't clean, I'm inclined to see these, I'm, 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 I'm siding with, with Yaniv and, and Tom on, this is an extra procedural hurdle. I sometimes I'm hungry about what came afterwards, what came next, what happened to the amendment, but also are the courts still independent in, in country X? Having said that, without a doubt, Sylvia's book is an extremely important contribution. We wouldn't be having this conversation had she not moved the conversation forward. And I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Thank you very much, Renata. A clean, a clean sweep of rave reviews, uh, uh, Sylvia. Um, before I hand over to Sylvia to uh, respond to those reviews, I don't see any questions from the audience, and, and obviously you don't have to ask questions if you don't have one to ask, but um, if you do have a question, do type it into the question and answer, and I will read them out after Sylvia's delivered her reply. Otherwise, I will ask my questions, um, and after we've had a round of questions, I'll go back to the panel to ask them for their final thoughts, and then Sylvia can have the final say. Uh, but Sylvia, in response to the comments that have been made? Thank you, first of all, to, to everyone for engaging so uh, so deeply with the ideas in, in the book and also for giving me an opportunity to say more about ideas that I couldn't address in the introduction or couldn't indeed address in, in the book because as you know, you know, when writing choices must be made, stacks of research must be <laughs> set, set aside um, and with, with the hope of returning to it uh, at, a, at a later point. Um, I think I should go in in the order in which the comments were made um, and starting with with Haley, thank you for that and not just for you know the praise but also for giving me an opportunity to reflect a bit more on how this all relates to to the UK constitutional debates and it's always interesting to me to present my research to, an, to a UK audience because some of that audience will be a bit perplexed about what the problem actually is because for a political constitutionalist of a certain ilk, you know, the idea of um, this type of deep entrenchment is, is very, um, you know, uneasy, let's put it euphemistically, right? So they would dismiss it offhand. And I think that's wrong as well for, for some of the reasons that you yourself raised, because there are strands in uh, UK constitutional 
not just the base, but in, in the case law itself that seem very much to echo exactly this type of substantive entrenchment you've mentioned. Uh, Jackson, we can mention, you know, constitutional statutes as inching towards a form of entrenchment that, that is, is in parallel to this. Um, you know, I, I still think, you know, the debate is a bit different just because of um, the context and, and the different history and also the different self-understanding of, um, of judges and what they do when they give those uh, decisions. But uh, to your initial question, Haley, is this analysis in any way sort of applying to, to the UK? I think it does. And so far as we are witnessing uh, courts and judges more and more sorts of um, identifying not unamendable as such in the context of an uncodified constitution, but um, really fundamental elements of the constitution, including um, the uses of constitutional conventions, including um, the use of the prerogative power and reviewing that in novel ways. So your first question, you know, are the Miller cases relevant here? Yes, they would have been. And I guess had I started the, the PhD now, maybe <laughs> I would have started uh, with a more central role for, for the UK in, in this story. Um, your second question was whether my analysis, you know, how does it sit with the strong week um, for judicial review debates and more generally the, the debates on legitimacy of judicial review. So I should say, I guess, you know, back in the day of the PhD days, I spent a lot of time um, in those debates, you know, working more and all, all of that. So I think there is absolutely an echo uh, there. But what I did want to do with the book specifically is actually deliberately move beyond that as being the framework that, that sort of sets the stage for this story. Um, part of it, because I think, you know, the more interesting um, unamendability developments actually don't happen in, in the countries that they, that these scholars are mostly thinking of. It's not in the US and it's not in the UK, and it's often not common law countries, or at least not Western common law countries, uh, where these, you know, really fascinating doctrines are being thought through and expanded and attempted to be reined in and resisted, as in the case of, of Sri Lanka. So um, that's part of why I don't engage in as much depth uh, with that literature. But cards on the table, you know, I am someone who came to this uh, constitutional system from abroad with um, sort of ecumenical uh, education, if you will, um, and, and sort of was exposed to um, UK public law and learned to love it, <laughs> you know? So um, I think there would be quite a bit that a, um, an advocate of weak judicial review would like about the book, same um, for political constitutionalists, but it's not, I don't think the argument necessarily tracks that, that binary and I don't, I don't intend it to. I don't think um, the answer to the question I often get asked, so, you know, do you enshrine a, a formal eternity clause? Do you develop a basic structure doctrine in this constitutional context? I don't think that answer is that easy. It's not, a, it's not something you can answer in the, in the abstract. Um, and your, your final question on the material constitution and the social order, whether that's really what constrains right, and prevents backsliding, I think that that is, that tracks with a lot of what you and uh, had to say as well, the answer is, is yes. I do believe uh, though that formal constitutions also have a, an educational role and a, a very significant symbolic role as well, not just um, sort of, you know, effects in, in real terms of blocking or, or allowing certain changes and certain policies to, to be passed, but, but they matter, they speak for we the people and should, um, should also enshrine a certain vision of, of society and of democracy indeed. So with that said, I think, um, you know, what would I say? Is it, um, is there still a place for formal eternity clauses or is all that matters uh, material constitution? No, I do think there is a place in our un analysis and understanding for formal um, constitutions and uh, case law and all that. I, I think it would kick me out of the law school if I believed otherwise. But even even so, um, just because, you know, for all that it is insulated and a technical language, law plays a significant role in society, again, to educate and to deliver a certain message and to embody a certain message. And, you know, that is also, I mean, it might sound like a high level of abstraction, but I think um, when we're looking at unamendability and, and eternity clauses, often they are actually pitched at that higher level of abstraction and make these identitarian claims and make these claims about the polity that need to be scrutinized quite seriously. 
Um, I move on to, to you and many, many uh, rich comments. Thank you for, for those, um, which again, give me an opportunity to say more about my own commitments and, um, and what I couldn't say in the book. So I think um, maybe I can start by saying a future project, um, eternity clauses in sociological constitutionalism, <laughs> 20, you know, 40, uh, stay tuned. Um, you know, uh, I'll reiterate something I said to Haley, but put it slightly differently. I think paradoxically for all my skepticism about formal eternity clauses in particular, it is a book that attempts to, to make the argument that constitutional formalism actually matters. Because a lot of, um, the, at least the early readings of eternity clauses had it that, well, you know, they're symbolic, they don't really matter that much, or it's other things in the constitution that matter, and these, you know, are there as add-ons or sort of lofty claims about um, the polity that we, you know, don't worry so much about a, a clause that enshrines formal language or formal religion or um, yeah, even a, a term limit. What's the harm, right? Signal certain, certain um, ideals and principles and values having been enshrined at the time of, of adoption and we can sort of move on and focus on, on other things, the things that really matter. And I think that's wrong. And I, I tried to bring in um, a vast array of, of case studies to show that even these seemingly innocuous formal clauses, or even um, seemingly benign elements of judicially crafted doctrines actually do have this, this dark side. And that um, leads me to answer in part, at least your question about where this leaves uh, judges and, and whether they are empowered or, or self-empowered. So that, you're very right, that is in a way, sort of a partial argument that I drum on about in, in the book, but um, what I do want to show with those examples is that through um, the, the means of unamendability and speaking the language of judicial independence, Supreme Courts in places as varied as India and to Slovakia have actually expanded their own um, their own power and you know held on um, to a judicial role in in this instance, in judicial, in the judicial appointments process, that actually was not um, necessarily or not overtly undermined by the attempt to revise it. So here you have um, a story where I think it is a story of, of self-empowerment and, and grabbing on to power. The other um, example that's usually given is that there are numerous formal eternity clauses that don't actually come uh, in constitutions that formally uh, empower constitutional courts to review them. Now, I don't think um, a court looking at an eternity clause um, and an absence of um, constitutional review powers over that eternity clause is necessarily um, problematic in the sense of, of meaning the court shouldn't look at it and it's just a symbolic commitment. Um, I think, you know, these are clauses that are meant to be sort of operational, if, if you want me to use that, that term. Um, so that argument about uh, judicial self-empowerment is really trying to track, again, these seemingly benign elements of a basic structure doctrine or of court interventions um, reviewing amendment packages and striking down, lo and behold, you know, the revision to a judicial appointments procedure or attempts to rein in constitutional review powers that hadn't been there in the original constitution but were inserted and now can't be pulled back because it's an attack on judicial independence. So to me, this is just um, another example of how uh, unamendability, you know, does empower judges. And we may like it sometimes, but we should also be aware that they are very reluctant, if not, uh, you know, completely opposed to give them back that power. And I want to address your, um, uh, your question about self-government as well, because that allows me to say indeed more about, um, you know, what kind of constitutionalist do I see myself as being and therefore uh, what position have I written this, this book from? And, and you're very right, I didn't have the space to, to return to that at length, but, but it is implicit, I think, in the, in the critique. So I say, the approach here is that of a democratic constitutionalist, echoing people uh, like Andrew Arato in part, 
um, a sociological constitutional is like Paul Volcker in part and, and others um, as well. There are some echoes there of uh, Joel Fuller Rios um, and other people who I think what we share, even though we're not uh, normatively in our commitments, um, sometimes converge and sometimes diverge, but it is an emphasis on not just self-government, but also a type of responsive and open constitutionalism that whether formal or informal unamendability really stifles or even completely does away with. So what is the alternative and what is the vision of constitutionalism that, that I have? Well, it will be a participatory one. So when we're looking at processes of constitutional change, it will be processes that do involve a variety of actors, um, including uh, the people directly, but, but not only. Um, and it would be a form of constitutionalism that doesn't forever close off the possibility of, of change, um, if for no other reason, but because of all these um, all these bad things that could happen, you know, all the, the dark side of unamendability that, um, that I've been talking about in, in the book. And I should say, um, it's not a thin version of constitutionalism, which I think you were hinting at in, in your remarks. It's not, uh, it's not the thinness that I would emphasize, but it is this openness and, and responsiveness. Um, you know, because I believe that we are fallible and forever perfectible and, and that the best uh, way to design a constitution, if we're talking about a codified constitution, would be to, to make room for that revisability. And that doesn't exclude entrenchment entirely. You can have tiered, um, tiered amendments. So, you know, making certain forms of amendment harder is, is still, still leaves uh, the door open for for some change happening at some point and, and doesn't, first of all, send a strong message about um, you know, non-negotiable pre-commitment. And it doesn't, I, I argue in the book, bring in the courts in, in, the, same, in the same way. And I know there are more, there are more things you said that I would love to, to address, but you, know, you can push me uh, to, to return to them. Uh, please do if, if I missed them. Um, I mean, this point about other actors involved in constitutional change and constitutional review and constitutional defense is an excellent point and one which I agree with entirely. Um, I think Stephen Garbaum makes this, uh, this point in his um, in a, a piece uh, that I might be citing in the book, um, but you know, in response to what to do about democratic backsliding and, and his response, you know, here's a menu of things that you need to, to look at and it's not any single one thing and I think I think that's right. I think it is not to be a very popular answer because that means you really have to work at it. And, and it, you know, sometimes the, the force might have left the stable in a sense. Um, by the time you realize that all these things needed to be fortified, it might be, uh, it might be too late. So maybe that's a good point to transition to, to Renata's comments here, um, which were as excellent as, as ever. So thank you for them. Um, your point about um, emphasizing or, or bringing out who brought the case. Um, was the court packed? Was it independent? Excellent, excellent point. So in a sense, I, I take it as more as a call for more context for each decision, which, um, you know, I'll do that thing that I hate when people do and say, yeah, there just wasn't space in the book to do all of that. But it is, I share this, this emphasis on context and, and methodological terms. I think without that, we don't really understand either why, did, why the decision that was rendered was rendered, but also why, uh, why the stakes were so high and in what way they were, they were high. But to me, this is a, um, often, you know, if we do investigate many of the cases that I look at, the, I think the argument of the book actually gets reinforced that courts turn out, that courts that do um, embrace these doctrines or, you know, engage in self, um, self-empowerment are often not neutral actors. And that could, you know, that could mean that they are pro-government or anti-government. So if you look at the Turkish constitutional court as it developed, you know, um, for, for a while, it was sort of against, um, it, it was trying to block the government's agenda, but it was doing so in the name of still, um, in part, exclusionary values and with exclusionary outcomes when it, when it came to, uh, to the Kurds. I think Here's where I, I will say, you know, for future research. But another thing I would want to uh, to explore in, in in a piece is uh, 
the link here with abstract review because often we you know we focus on uh, on colonial jurisdictions and we focus on systems where uh, judicial review is decentralized and cases um, emerge in that way but actually um, at least a lot of the, the cases I discuss in the book are instances where the courts you know didn't self-empower because they were formal formally part of the uh, amendment process and the constitutional stamp of approval from the court was necessary and was a, a predetermined element of that um, of the amendment uh, the amendment process so <laughs> you know I, I agree that there needs to be more uh, more context for for each of these decisions um, and it would will indeed be very interesting to see um, how the Kenyan case in particular um, makes its way through the judicial system. I think what uh, the Kenyan High Court did very well to bolster it, the legitimacy um, of its own decision, not just in doctrinal terms, was uh, to engage you know, with Kenyan constitutional history as robustly as it did, to, um, to emphasize the importance of participation in the constitutional amendment process. They were bringing in the Kenyan people and saying, you know, you can't do this also because the Kenyan constitutional ethos is participatory and this whole package seeks to upend the constitution without the people being involved there. And also the fact that it spoke with um, a unanimous voice, you know, as we saw in uh, the Miller Cherry decision in this country, you know, that is a, an informal kind of, you know, uh, there's no rule for that, but it does, um, both of the, the legitimacy of, of that one voice that does emerge. Um, I think there were two, two more points, one on militant democracy, and if I understood it correctly, the point was that, you know, how courts engage in risk assessment will be historically uh, contingent and, or contextually contingent. And, and of course, I, I agree with that. And because of the scope of the book, maybe, you know, again, that context doesn't necessarily always emerge as, as well as um, as it should. I think, you know, what I would say, just as a skeptic here, is to say also that sometimes those types of arguments are used as um, as foils, and um, you know, our courts are hiding behind them um, again to entrench the st status quo. Or not, not just that, but if you look at a really particular case like that of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where you ended up with the St. Ishvi and Sinchi case um, reaching the Strasbourg court, there you had two different, very different visions of um, whether uh, Bosnian society had reached um, the, you know, the, um, the point of sufficient stability for certain unamendable commitments, human rights commitments, but that resulted in discriminatory outcomes, whether those could be removed or not. And, you know, you had the whole, that the really fundamental debate for Bosnia society be completely judicialized. And, and in the end, the final word being with, with Strasbourg. And I think, you know, there's something deeply unsettling about that being, um, in the end, who decides and, and how that issue was, was decided, at least for, for, that, uh, for the time being. And on the point of uh, transnational actors, I think um, this was another one where I wish if, I wish I had more space in, in the book to say more about about it. I am watching this space to see, um, you know, probably Turkish and Russian others as well uh, cases reaching Strasbourg in, in the coming years, where it will again have an opportunity to uh, uh, to opine on possibly unconstitutional amendments or at least deeply problematic um, amendments. Do I think they should rely on subsidiarity? No, call a spade a spade. But I do think if, um, you know, there will be costs to pay, including for, um, um, for the position of, of the Strasbourg court itself that it will likely be mindful of and probably not want to, you know, to touch. So uh, I don't know if the Baca the Hungary case is, um, is the beginning of, um, Strasbourg doing more of that type of, uh, of amendment review or actually, you know, was pinnacle and then it's all downhill from there. Uh, and I'll stop there, I think, and, and hand over to Nick again. Thank yes. you, though, to all. Sylvia, thank you very much. We've got um, two questions and I've, I've got a couple of uh, thoughts as well that I'll add to them. So I'll give you the two questions and my thoughts. 
and let you come back on that and then invite the panel to have uh, uh, to comment on them. The first uh, question is from Stefan, Stefan Thiel, um, who writes that he would be happy to hear some more reflections on the role of eternity clauses in relation to EU integration. Um, there's a very fashionable view in the literature, says Stefan, that is dismissive of constitutional, uh, domestic constitutional concerns generally, and eternity, eternity clauses in particular. It does not strike me as unreasonable, though, he says, for a constitutional court like the German to insist that it ultimately must police the transfer and exercise of power to the EU, much as it is not unreasonable for the EU to insist on EU law supremacy. Can there ever be a legal answer to this question? If, if you think not, I, if think not, says Stefan, I think he thinks not, but he would love to hear uh, your thoughts, uh, uh, Sylvia. The next question comes from Gaurav Makaji um, and is in two parts. The first is addressed to Sylvia, and uh, it goes that um, he would imagine that there has been a rise in judicial interventions in enforcing um, express or imposing implied limits on formal constitutional amendment power between the time you began to write your work and the present date. Um, it's certainly become a very fashionable thing. Um, of course, this will likely to have something to do with the phenomenon of democratic backsliding and judges across the countries looking to engage with this. Are there alternative um, explanations for that proliferation? So I suppose that's beyond uh, the democratic backsliding uh, point. And the second question uh, uh, that Gaurav asks is directed to Renata and asks, um, could you reflect on the kinds of review, sovereignty and identity that the Constitutional Court of Hungary has erected and the way it has used and abused precedent from the German Constitutional Court to build this type of review to present a barrier against further European integration and or deviation from European human rights standards like those on LGBTQI uh, rights. Is this part of an implied unamendability eternity clause? With the pact court, what is your view on the prospects of success for the constitutional convention which the United Opposition has called for? Should they win? It asks. Um, I just wanted to raise uh, two thoughts with you, just, just to hear what you, you, you had to say about them. First, I enjoyed reading about constitutional identity in the book. I think it's really interesting and um, underexplored and also deeply mysterious. <laughs> um, so I wondered about the connection between the idea of constitutional identity in the basic structure doctrine and why it was thought, why people are writing about the basic structure doctrine and courts thought that the preservation of constitutional identity was of necessity valuable. What, what, why that would be thought as something that, 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 that should be worth um, preserving. Um, do you think it might be because um, this creates that wonderful illusion of neutrality in the theorist's work? That the theorist doesn't have to adopt a normative position but can say, it's the constitutional identity that should be preserved. And doesn't it create the rather odd uh, uh, consequence that if you have a really evil country, then it could be the evil uh, uh, that is preserved while we, we, by this rule that says the constitutional identity is, is worth preserving. So that's my first observation. My second observation um, that comes out of both what you're saying and also Stefan's question, I suppose, is um, I like the way in your uh, book you bring out the, the the dangers that this can pose to the judiciary, the problems this poses for judges. Um, and there is a paradox to entrenchment that at an initial point of time, people come together and think something is so obviously brilliant that it must be put beyond change. But at the same time, they think that their successors are going to want to change it. So there's that sort of fundamental paradox about um, entrenchment. And it puts the judges in a, a, a very difficult position because the judges are asked to stand up as it were against um, a political movement for, for, for change in the constitution. Um, I suppose that's slightly mitigated where the eternity clause is expressed because then the judge is acting in partnership with the authors of the constitution and has got some cover. But I would imagine it, where it's uh, uh, implicit in the basic structure doctrine, it then becomes very acute indeed because the judge has no real uh, uh, cover. The judge is inventing these limits and applying them. And when Haley was talking about the rise of constitutional principles in the United Kingdom, it made me think that they were that these judges were playing a very dangerous game, perhaps indeed, uh, uh, by, by, by drawing on these things as potential constraints over Parliament. And the reason why I thought this tied into what uh, Stefan was asking you, Sylvia, is that in a sense, maybe it's a lot easier for a judge, a national judge, to use ideas of eternity clauses and constitutional identity against an external uh, threat, if I can use an in inverted commas, like the EU, when it's not acting contrary to uh, the political will of the, the political side of the constitution, but is using these ideas as a way to stop encroachment from outside. 
So uh, three uh, sets of questions and observations, uh, Sylvia. Um, we'd be very interested to hear what your thoughts are. Thank you once more to, to all of you for those wonderful, wonderful questions. Um, I'll start with, with Stefan's. Uh, I don't see, but I'll wave to. Um, and I think there is a bridge here indeed to, to your question, Nick, um, on, on the EU. So it gives me a chance to, to say a bit more about constitutional identity, which is another one of those, those concepts and, and ideas that you wouldn't necessarily have found very much written about um, a decade ago. Um, you know, there were a couple of books and then there seemed to be nothing and then we're all talking constitutional identity all of a sudden, no doubt because of um, you know, the rise of constitutional identity review um, in, in Europe with many um, constitutional courts embracing this, um, this notion and relying on it. Um, to rein in EU integration in, in various different different ways. Now, to Stefan's point, um, that you know, many scholars view this uh, type of intervention dismissively. I think many EU scholars, in particular, who are uh, you know who can't possibly imagine um, national courts having anything to to do with this, or or there needing to be any any limits. And I don't take that view whatsoever. What um, how I end up talking about. Uh, the German case law in particular, and then with brief mentions to uh, to some, some other um, European jurisdictions is through this lens of uh, constitutional identity, because what really interests me in the German uh, case law on this is um, the way these constitutional identity arguments have played out and the way Article 79.3 comes in uh, as part of this repositioning of stakes in, in the debates and how they are used by the German federal constitutional court in order not just to, to set limits to what, you know, to you integration, but also, and this is what I actually find unnerving, to hint, uh, for instance, in the Lisbon decision, that these are limits that w might um, operate to, to halt or, um, or restrain future constitution making processes as well. So to me, in a sense, it's, it's not just the European integration argument, but it's also how the German uh, court seems to read what Article 79.3, which is the German basic laws, um, a formal eternity clause, what it's there to do. So it's not just, it doesn't seem to be just, um, you know, the enshrinement of, of a militant democracy ethos of back in, in the post-war years, but increasingly it seems to to underpin this very expansive understanding of where the limits are and i think that is something that's harder to justify even in the german context i think there's another story to be to be told here that's very interesting about how this um how this interpretation of um of limits to eu integration is is playing out in a context in a constitutional context that was otherwise quite open to eu integration not just as you know, call architects, but the principle, the constitutional principle of open statehood was also enshrined in this constitution. So, so there is, I think, a broader story to be told there. I agree with you. I think we shouldn't be as dismissive or as easily dismissive of what uh, the German court is, is doing. But where I am suspicious uh, of them doing this is doing it in the name of a formal eternity clause that didn't necessarily, you know, when you go back, uh, to the drafting didn't seem to be there to do to perform that role. So I think it's actually um, instrumentalizing fundamentability and and those those hints that it might block future constitution making processes are also quite, quite alarming. Um, I'll move on to to Gaurav's point about what other explanations might be for this rise in um, in I guess judicial doctrines being developed. Um, although there is I think. Um, um, there might be also a rise, or, or at least not, an, uh, not a, a diminishment of interest among constitution makers and formal constitution making processes and adopting formal eternity clauses as well, if not just democratic backsliding. It's certainly that as well. Part of it is probably also uh, the migration of constitutional ideas and inf you know, different constitutional systems influencing each other, uh, neighbors influencing their, their region, uh, the Indian Supreme Court is usually influential and the basic structure doctrine has migrated to, to the region uh, quite significantly, as you know, which I do cover in the book. I think it's interesting to look at those who are at the, at the holdouts as well. So, you know, the Sri Lankan 
um, example, but also um, French context, but it's all a history of, of um, resisting substantive review of constitutional amendment to get a better understanding of what are the drivers of embracing this. I think there's a story there to, to be told about the rise of strong form judicial review, the rise of the argument in, um, especially in sort of constitutional assistance circles um, and, and with international organizations even, that seems to suggest that without a strong form of constitutional review and a strong constitutional court, you just can't have a you know, democracy. So those types of arguments playing out in a post-conflict context, in a fragile context can be, you know, pose risks, let's, let's put it this way. Um, because it seems to suggest that, that is, it, it puts a lot of the burden on the constitutional court itself that is then created to, to solve all these problems. And, and often that can't be for institutional capacity reasons, for all sorts of other reasons. A good example that I do cover in, in the book is Tunisia's example, which moved from um, a French model of Conseil Constitutionnel to a constitutional court that was meant to, to figure out all of these um, interpretive issues about the, the constitution, which incidentally also has the type of black box uh, eternity clause uh, with commitments to un unamendable commitments to Islam and um, presidential term limit and other things. And that court has yet to be uh, to to actually um, be appointed and to, to start its work. So there. Um, to go back to Gaurav's point, you know, there are many um, other explanations we could give here and methodologically as comparatives, we could probably uh, speak more about that separately. And I get to Nick, Nick's two wonderful questions, or three, what was that? <laughs> sort of two plus one. Um, the deeply mysterious constitutional identity, uh, indeed, as part of the critique as well, that, uh, you know, it, it sounds so good and was embraced by many as a seemingly Something that we know when when we see it, and I think that's that's wrong. I think the more we see it operationalized in actual uh, case law, the harder it is to um, to avoid the conclusion that it is sometimes instrumentalized. That it is um, that these types of identity-based arguments are are used in uh, potentially pernicious uh, ways. Is it the illusion of of neutrality that made it so appealing? Um, potentially, and in some context, uh, it is that. I think it's also an illusion of sort of pacification or um, of coherence as well. There is a constitutional identity that you can um, reliably identify has been breached. And then, you know, that gives you the answer in any, um, in, a, in a problematic moment. So, you know, you avoid that going down that path. And um, to be fair, scholars of constitutional identity theorists like um, Gary Jacobson do admit that it isn't necessarily a pacified concept and he talks about constitutional disharmony, but I still think that that is, it's underplaying it. I think the examples that I try to cover in the book show that actually it goes beyond that. It's not, even disharmony sounds relatively peaceful, but if you say disharmony to a Palestinian or you say disharmony to um, an ethnic um, minority Hungarian person in Romania, you know, they wouldn't hear disharmony, they would, they would hear um, sort of legal formalism, constitutional formalism being repeatedly used um, against them in the name of a constitutional identity that is purported to have been agreed upon by all. And that leads me to your second point about the paradox of, of entrenchment that you so nicely called. Um, and what I will say there is that, um, you know, part of what I tried to do in the book is to actually push back against that um, the contours of that paradox itself, because the way that story is told and then reaches uh, the court perhaps as well is um, exactly to say, you know, we've had our founding moment, we've agreed. Now we test the judges to make sure that that agreement never um, is never breached. So mm -hmm. they, they have their uh, tasks set out for them. And I think that is, um, it's a very simplistic way of looking at things. It won't always be open to, to judges necessarily to, to push back as much as I would want them against that narrative. But I think they can sometimes push back against the foundational narrative insofar as it leads to exclusionary and, um, uh, and discriminatory sometimes outcomes um, as well. So that I would actually challenge the, the contours of, of the paradox um, as well. Is it what makes it easier to use against an external threat? 
such as the EU, possibly, uh, although at least in the German case, it has been used internally quite extensively as well. Um, I'll stop there and give Renata a chance to answer her question, but thank you to all. Thank you, Sylvia, and you, and you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to, to pass over to Renata to see if uh, Renata wanted to respond to the question on uh, Hungary. Well, the, I, mean, I, I love the question because it, it perfectly exposes why I'm so interested in the dialogue, dialogic nature of, of these court judgments and why I believe that they are part of a, of a deliberative process. So I got called, called out, but uh, I, and, I, and I think it's crucial to, to see that on, on the one hand, the Hungarian court for, for two decades built a jurisprudence where they were trying to incorporate European norms and then at a crucial point after the 2010 elections, the court said that, look, there is actually an, an unamendable core based on uh, public internet, use code against norms of public international law and bits and pieces of, of European human rights law. Sadly, we can't enforce any of, of the limitations on, on constitutional amendment that come from it. So this is, this, this is the perfect deferential judgment, right? In principle, in practice, it triggered constitutional amendments trying to, to clip the, the powers of, 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 of the court. But uh, I, so I, I think that uh, what, what the Hungarian story, and this is the, the answer to the first part, of, first part of the question, actually emphasizes is that it's, it's very much a, a dialogue and it's a dialogue of, of informed politicians and courts who know what they are doing. And it, it is in this context that, that I actually want to, to drag Sylvia back to, to Kenya, because on the, on, the, uh, on the BBI judgments uh, substantive part, on a basic structure, Gautam Bhatia, among others, has a wonderful piece on the, the elephant, but very few people pay attention to is actually how the court says that the president cannot just activate the popular initiative and thus the people in order to trigger a constitutional amendment. And my, my bet is that for comparative purposes, that line of argument is probably potentially even more important if we are trying to, to, to chase abuse and tyranny of, 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 of the majority. Now, the second part of the answer to, to, to Gora, whether I expect the, the court, I mean, the court is not setting barriers to integration. It's, it's pouring sand into the machine creates uh, opportunities for, for the government to activate constitutional identity, and then the Court of Justice will strike this down. Uh, and of course, it's doing it at the same time when in other cases, it's very friendly to the CGA. you saying that, you know, I'm gonna suspend my judgment until I hear from you. And this is why I was so interested in, 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 in the broader context of these cases that you might have the big bang identity judgment, but at the same time, these courts are playing judicial politics also on the supranational level, and I, and I think that that's an important part of, 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 of the picture. I mean, the Hungarian court might go very pragmatic, and if the opposition wins the elections, if, 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 it, it might actually use identity arguments to prevent the amendment of some of the identitarian uh, war on gender type of amendments which were adopted in December, it might prevent the removal of those amendments, but it can also get uh, and, and, and build a totally different line bit by bit, because each it's the master of the identity argument. And, and here I want to come back to Sylvia, because I'm fascinated by the Romanian Constitutional Court's uh, judgment from December on, 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 on gender in, in education, how the Romanian Constitutional Court essentially says that, look, we, we, we look at the trends in the legal system, how the concept of, of gender was incorporated. It's not mentioned in the constitution, but you know, there is a trend in ECHI jurisprudence. There, is, there are bits and pieces of secondary EU law uh, which, were, which, which, which we welcome in the legal system. So ultimately to my mind, the Romanian court changed meaning there. I'm not trying to say constitutional identity is now in Romania embracing gender diversity fully, but it's definitely a very sneaky 
way of, of doing something that goes against the trend in Central Europe at the moment. And I'm wondering whether this is an outlier or, or whether the Romanian court is actually onto something larger. And I would like to bring it back to Sylvia if Nick permits. I, I do. We have to finish at 6.30. So, uh, Ewan and Haley, do you have anything you, you, you strongly want to say or shall I pass it back to Sylvia for a final, a final word? Just an absolutely final congratulations on, on, on a stellar contribution to the literature, that's all. <laughs> um, absolutely the same. I'd much rather Sylvia had the time than I did. Sylvia, you have the, the, the final few minutes. Uh, big responsibility that to entertain you for another five minutes and keep you from the game. Uh, thank you uh, to, to Renata, but to, to all of you, who, if I don't if I don't remember to say it uh, yet again for, for the comments and the questions. I'll engage with Renata's point, very last point about the Romanian Constitutional Court and its judgment on, um, on gender ideology being taught in um, so-called gender ideology being taught in, uh, in schools and universities and, and that judgment, uh, which was quite surprising, you know, to Romanian uh, observers because uh, it bucked the trend, it seemed like, in, in the region with um, an otherwise quite formalist and not very imaginative constitutional court, not, not a court known for its um, sort of discursive judgments, again, being euphemistic here, um, actually engaging with some of the literature on, um, on gender and the trends, as you say, in, in European human rights law in particular. I think, to my mind, that is a, a case of a court trying to position itself um, differently from, from its counterparts in, in other um, countries in, in the region. Um, there had been, as you know, um, some personnel changes, so some of the judges that um, are on the bench are a bit more uh, open to these, uh, to these trends and to positioning the court, I think, as as a player, um, not as you know, not not as retrogressive. I think it is interesting to to also note, though, that there are quite you know the there are resources in the Romanian constitution that I don't think have been explored enough. And I'll give you another example there. Uh, the judgment in one of the judgments on same sex uh, on the same sex marriage referendum, which the constitutional court in Romania had to certify, uh, one of the dissenters his argument had been, so, you know, the court certified the um, um, going to a referendum on, on the matter, but one of the, the dissenters who thought there was a gender equality problem there actually um, offered an interpretation of the Romanian constitutional, uh, Romanian constitution's provision on marriage as between uh, spouses as actually offer, being capacious enough to include same-sex marriage, which I think was actually right. Now that interpretation, of course, didn't square with uh, the original intention of, of the founders, but just to say that even though we're not used to seeing it, I think I would, um, I would say, you know, courts in the region are if, if, this is, if this is the direction they're going in, to engage in more propulsive interpretation and to be a bit more creative with what they think the limits of um, constitutional identity, um, I, we don't have to go there, right? Of, of the constitution itself, I think that that is, a, that is very much welcome. Um, and, and final thought on the constitutional identity uh, points, I think where my skepticism comes from uh, beyond providing examples of um, exclusionary constitutional identity, um, is to say that if we, if our position on whether we like uh, a constitutional identity review case or not depends on its substantive outcome, you know, then what work is this concept doing? If, if it can swing every which way and it can be abused and, and then deployed properly when, when we like the outcome in a given case, then maybe, maybe it's not doing the work that it should be doing and maybe it's not, it's not a, a concept that that is helpful, um, but it is possibly a for, for, for other types of arguments. If I may, final thoughts um, here. Um, you know, I've run the gamut on um, reactions to unamendability and how to read them. I, I started many years ago being quite enthusiastic about them, then possibly because of my, my Edinburgh supervisors were really skeptical about them, and now I'm somewhere in between. And I think what I would leave the audience with is to say, you know, if we are committed um, constitutionalists, but also Democrats, and also good comparatists. I think we need to look at these less well-traveled um, cases and to look critically at this uh, undoubted expansion of, of interest in unamendability, both scholarly and uh, doctrinal, and, and look at it soberly and assess on a case-by-case -case basis and with due 
regard to context. And I hope the book does that, at least in part. And I thank you once again for your wonderful comments. Well, thank you very much. Um, at this point in the evening, normally I would be inviting uh, the audience and the panel to go for a drinks reception in the in the Bonavero. Unfortunately, that's not possible. But the Bonavero has asked me to uh, tell you that if you have got any alcohol in your house, you should now feel free to drink as much of it as you can get hold of. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia, for such a great book that stimulated such um, um, a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Renata. Thank you, Ewan. And thank you again to the Bonavero for hosting. It's been a great, great fun and very interesting. Thank you very much.